How's everybody doing? Good. 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 All right. So again, my name is Richard Seward. I'm the Senior Policy Analyst for State Policy at Children's Health Watch. We are based at Boston Medical Center. And so the roadmap for this presentation, the slide deck that I've got prepared, it's about 20 to 30 minutes. However, I want to encourage people, if you have questions throughout, please raise your hand. I'd really like this to be more of a conversation. Um, but I've left about a half an hour just for Q&A. Um, and so what we're going to do, I'm going to introduce Children's Health Watch, explain who we are, um, talk about the need for screening patients, especially children, for food insecurity in healthcare settings, the creation of what we've dubbed the Hunger Vital Sign, a validated two-item food security screening tool. Um, I'm going to share some examples of what people are doing with this tool throughout the United States. Um, overview some public policy challenges and also some solutions and I'd really like to have a conversation on ways that food shelves, food banks, anti-hunger agencies can partner with health centers and hospitals to reduce food security and to improve health. So Children's Health Watch, we're a nonpartisan pediatric research group. We're a group of pediatricians, public health researchers, and child health policy experts. We're based in Boston at Boston Medical Center, but we operate in five cities in total. That includes Philadelphia, Baltimore, Minneapolis, and Little Rock, Minnesota, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. And our mission is to improve the health of young children in America by informing policies that address and alleviate economic hardships. And we collect frontline health care research and uh, we share that research with policymakers, other academics, and the general public to help inform different policies. Um, those are the cities we're in. Um, the way that we do our work, um, we actually don't have children collecting the data. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a picture of my daughter Beatrice taking her friend's uh, blood pressure at daycare. Um, we have research assistants embedded in the emergency department of the hospitals we work in. And whenever a caregiver brings their young child, so under the age of four, infants and toddlers, into the ED, we have a research assistant approach them and ask, can we do a quick 30-minute survey with you? And we ask all kinds of questions around baby's health, mother's health, father's health, caregiver health in general, um, public assistance programs that they're participating in, different sorts of needs that they have. Um, food insecurity, housing insecurity, energy insecurity, medical trade-offs, those are some of the biggest issues that we see. Um, we focus on kids because they're an invisible group. They're not old enough to really cause uh, too much trouble. They're not taking high-stakes tests in school. They really kind of only interact with their parents and uh, their doctors. And so it's, it's an invisible group, and it's a critical window of time. Um, this is a uh, a really um, interesting chart, one of the only charts I promise I will show you. This is the course of human brain development over the first three years. And just looking at the first year, all you know, months, you know, really uh, prenatally through um, just past the first year, your language, your vision, your hearing, your higher cognitive functions, they're skyrocketing. Neural networks are being built. This is a critical window of opportunity. This is a critical um, time that our brains are literally being built. So in these first three years, what we call blooming and pruning occurs. So um, there are uh, synapses being built in milliseconds. And in the first three years, a child's brain will have twice as many synapses as it will in adulthood. So if you don't use it, you lose it kind of thing. And so that's why experiencing food insecurity and hardship during these three years can have a lifelong effect on kids' health. And what I mean by lifelong effect, if you look at both the unemployment rate and the weekly earnings for um, different levels of education, so if, you, um, if you're hungry as a child and your brain doesn't develop as the way it should, um, you're not going to do well in school, you're not going to do well in terms of your earnings and employment. And this is just one measure of success. I mean, this isn't the be-all, end-all measure of success. There are other measures as well, but this is just one way to look at it in terms of uh, human capital. So food security, I just want to um, go over sort of what the hunger vital sign is based on. The way that we measure food security in the United States, we kind of break it down on this scale. So there's food secure, so you have access at all times to enough food for a healthy, active life. 
Then there's food insecurity or low food security, which is a lack of access. We have no official measure of hunger, but the closest that we do get is what's called very low food security. And then there's another thing that isn't listed here that's called moderate food insecurity, and that's when you're technically food secure, but you're, you're not quite food insecure. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And so this scale was developed um, in the mid to late 90s, and it went through a ton of psychometric testing. It's what the USDA uses. It's what the census uses. Um, a, a report from the USDA comes out every year on the rate of food security in America. It's considered the gold standard. And um, just to go a little bit into the pathways through which food insecurity impacts the health of children and also adults. So there's the nutritional pathways and then the non-nutritional pathways. And some of the nutritional pathways, it really starts even before birth. It starts prenatally. So what's the nutrition of the mother while she's pregnant? Then you have the brain and cognitive development, which I uh, touched on a little bit earlier. And then there's those impacts on growth, development, um, the structural and systematic uh, anomalies. Obesity is another thing that a lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar with in terms of children both being food insecure and obese. And then there's immune system issues and then energy deficits. And the non-nutritional pathways in which food insecurity impacts health, these are sort of the social sphere, um, the adverse impacts on the relationship between mother and child. There's this thing called serve and return. It's incredibly important for uh, early child development. And if mom is worried about where the next meal is going to come from, then there's not as much serve and return attention being paid to the child, and that's going to have um, negative effects. There's the, an impoverished home environment, lack of appropriate stimulation, nurturing support. Um, how many of you are familiar with the term toxic stress and ACEs, adverse childhood experiences? A lot of you. Great. So, um, you know, that's another non-nutritional pathway. And then you have the delays in medical care and non-compliance with treatment, including prescriptions. So, foregoing meals in order to pay for those prescriptions or not buying those prescriptions because you need to be able to feed your child. So, these are some of the non-nutritional pathways. Okay, so now that we have that ground covered, um, I want to talk about the hunger vital sign. So the seed of the idea was that there's a lot of research. Children's Health Watch has been doing this research since 1998. Others have been doing it um, for just as long, looking at the associations of poor health and developmental outcomes and food insecurity. And so we had these two interrelated kind of streams of interest. One was there's this group of moderately food insecure households that are being officially counted as food secure, but the research that we've shown, they're still having these negative health effects, even though they're officially food secure. So are we undercounting? Is the official measure undercounting? And the second stream was really, um, you know, that gold standard I showed you earlier, that's 18 questions. And in a clinical setting, in a community setting, to go through 18 questions takes a while. And so, is there a better way to do that? Can we maybe validate a shortened screener? And can, can I it be interrupt used you for a Yes, please do. Too. I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind using the microphone. Um, oh, because sure. Because the, there's some, uh, I think, interaction that's happening in the other workshop, which is great. Um, but it might be helpful to, thank you. I'm sorry for interrupting. Can I help? Okay. Okay. Is that a little better? Yeah. All right. Great. Um, so there were other shortened screeners that were produced. One was a, a six-item module, and that was also by the F, uh, USDA. But it was still a little bit too long to really use in a number of different community settings and healthcare settings. And other researchers had validated a one-question screening tool. Um, and that's great, but the, the exclusive focus on, on hunger. So this one question looks specifically at the physiologic sensation of hunger, so that very low food security, um, uh, the bottom of the scale that I explained earlier. Um, 
doesn't pick up as many families that are experiencing the psychological stress of food insecurity. And so we realize that there are shortened screeners, but we still need an efficient method identifying children in food insecure households to make sure that they have um, the ability to access healthy food, alleviate caregiver stress. So we want it to be brief, specific, and valid. And what we did was we took that gold standard, the 18 question screening tool by the USDA, and we asked a combination of all those questions. And what we came to was that the first two questions had the highest sensitivity and specificity. So 90% of families who identified as food insecure with the hunger vital sign were also food insecure with the USDA tool, and it also had high specificity. So what it's doing is it's catching people, and it's very specific. And we published this research in the journal Pediatrics in 2010, so about six years ago. And these are the two questions. So within the past 12 months, we worried whether our food would run out before we got money to buy more. So this gets at the, the stress and worry related to food insecurity. And then within the past 12 months, the food we bought just didn't last, and we didn't have money to get more. And the way that these questions are answered is often true, sometimes true, or never true. And if you answer one or both of these questions with often or sometimes true, then that's a positive screen. And what that would do essentially is trigger um, further sort of investigation. It doesn't mean that you are food insecure, it just means that there's a very high likelihood that that patient is food insecure and, and follow-up needs to happen. Um, we also uh, looked at the outcomes related to uh, children and, and mothers who screened positive, and they were 50% more likely to be in fair and poor health. That is a term um, that doesn't really uh, do what it actually is. It's a term that doesn't do it justice because fair and poor health is kind of vague, but um, to be in fair and poor health has um, very uh, high associations with uh, negative health outcomes. They were 17% more likely to be hospitalized since birth, 60% more likely to be at risk for developmental delays, and mothers also two times as likely to be in fair and poor health. And I'm sure um, a lot of you who work in the community, you see daily um, almost three times as likely to report depressive symptoms. And these are compared to families that were in food secure households. Okay, so now we have this screening tool. It's short, and I, it accurate I, identifies mothers and children and it's associated for health outcomes. And so now, how do we use this tool? We realized that um, people were, since 2010, beginning to use it, but there was really a need for this national you know, center of, of learning and best practices, and a way to um, you know, connect people in a way uh, so that it wasn't just called the two-item food insecurity screening tool, it was called something that people would know and identify, and so that's why we dubbed it the hunger vital sign. And we have published a couple of policy briefs, so there was that peer-reviewed journal article, and that's not really the easiest, most uh, digestible uh, format to explain this. And so we've produced a couple of policy briefs, and I have copies of them on the back table, and they're also um, uh, in the, the main ballroom. The hunger vital sign just overviews basically what the hunger vital sign is, and the Cultivating Healthy Communities Brief really is going to go into depth, um, greater detail over what I'm going to talk about in a moment. It's ways that health agencies are, are partnering with community agencies to both address food insecurity and health issues. And these are um, available on our website, childrenshealthwatch.org. And so a few examples um, from the field. So how it's being used. It's being used in hundreds of uh, locations around the United States, in hospitals, community health centers, public health agencies, health insurance providers are using it, food banks are using it, anti-hunger agencies, and also uh, a lot of research institutions. There are over 50 uh, peer-reviewed journal articles um, using the hunger vital sign as, as a research tool. So a few examples I'm going to give. Uh, ProMedica, a very large health insurer and provider based in Ohio. Oregon Food Bank. Second Harvest Heartland, which is operating in Minnesota. And Kaiser Permanente in Colorado, another very large health insurer and provider. Can I ask a question, please? Yes. So what, what would be the purpose of the health insurers utilizing the screening tool? 
What are they going to provide if they're identified? Right, that's a great question. Um, so if you think about a family or a child that is a, considered a high utilizer, you know, they're living in a home that is food insecure and they're getting sick a lot and they're coming in a lot and that's, that costs a lot of money. And so if you're an insurer and you're a payer, um, you'd like to bring your costs down and you know, be a little bit more affordable. If you can go upstream and identify these families, provide resources, sometimes all it takes is a bag of food, sometimes it's a little bit more, then you can you know, begin to drive those costs down a little bit. So it's in, in the insurers, um, especially insurers that are also providers, like uh, ProMedica and Kaiser Permanente. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, jump in. This is more about <laughs> how did how does food in, how could they you know why why was why did it take so long to identify the problem there? I mean, if, did they have this kind of a uh, thing for young children? Or, I know eventually it did, but yeah, I mean, I don't have an answer to that question, but I mean, children are tested for their lead levels um, when they go to their pediatrician. I mean, what happened in Flint is a number of breakdowns of our sort of public infrastructure and, um, you know, it, it goes to show the importance of connecting communities like health, health institutions and community agencies. Um, but I don't have an easy answer for why that happened. Was a pediatrician that finally just would not let it go. Mm -hmm. and finally brought it to life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's that story of uh, you know a doctor sitting by the river having a picnic, and all of a sudden there's a baby floating down the river, and so the doctor plucks the baby out, and then all of a sudden there are two babies, and then they pluck them out. No, this didn't actually happen. This is, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, is this is a story. And, um, and so, but all of a sudden all these babies are coming down the river, and this is only one doctor, and she can't pluck all of them out. And so what she did was she, you know, put her shoes on, and she walked up the river and figured out who was putting the babies in the river. And I think that's kind of the whole point of what we're trying to do here. Um, what's that? Exactly. Public health. Um, so, so what is ProMedica doing? So in Ohio, um, they are using the hunger vital sign. And also, let me just say quickly, we validated this for young children on the age of four and their caregivers. However, this also has been validated for all age groups. So if you work with seniors, this is a valid tool. If you work with adolescents, adults, it doesn't have to just be young kids. So ProMedica, they use this throughout their entire um, uh, hospital network. Patients present upon admission to the hospital. They are asked these two questions. And when they are discharged, they uh, receive a bag of food to bring home through their on-site food pantry. And they can return to that, they call it a food pharmacy, once every six months. They also have nutrition education by a registered dietitian. And that's just one way that they are doing all of this kind of in-house. Can I ask a question about mm -hmm. um, the term validated? Can you just describe for this audience what that means? Because I think it would be helpful um, you know, for those of us who might start to use use these questions to be able to explain what that means. Right, exactly. So the, the term validated. You know, in your work, if you want to figure out, is somebody hungry? Well, I could ask them, and you might, you know, you'll get an answer. But how do you really know that? And so that's that was what this whole 18-item USDA <coughs> tool, all that work and those years that went into that, all the psychometric testing, they really used scientific method to get down to yeah, we have a very strong uh, understanding that these questions will identify somebody as being food insecure or food secure and what level that is, where they lie. And so that was a valid tool. And then what we did was we took those 18 questions and we asked them in a, mul a multitude of different ways and figured out, you know, what had this highest sensitivity and the highest specificity. So are we actually measuring what we're trying to measure? And, and, and that process was able to, to validate these two questions as the two questions. And, um, you know, I know other, other groups will ask uh, different questions and, um, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but you're, you, you don't have that certainty that you're actually uh, measuring what you're trying to measure. Do you have a question? So you said that they go to the hospital and then they go to this um, pharmacy food bank? get a bag of food and then they can return in six months. What is the meantime? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's this a kid is not nourished, undernourished. What happens in those six months? Right. Yeah, that's not uh, that's not a, a total solution, right? That's no solution. Yeah. Bag of food every six months is not a solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't disagree with that's you. On, yeah. One bag, you don't agree that one bag of food is going to make a difference? Not, exactly. not the food. No, I no, I do agree with you. This is just one what well, one place is doing. No I know. I, I'm going to talk about a few other examples. I will say that. Yeah, this is what just ProMedica is doing, and it's something that they're they're building on. Um, and anything is, is better than nothing. At Boston Medical Center, where we're based, we were actually the very first in the in the country to have a, 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 a food pantry based at a hospital. And so we do something similar. We also have a co-located, right next door, an on-site WIC office. We have a demonstration kitchen. We have navigators who will sign patients up for SNAP, obviously WIC, um, and other resources. I mean, because food is one piece of the puzzle here. It's also housing. It's energy. And, and this is something that our navigators work on. So it's a more robust model than what ProMedica is doing. I just use them as Do one example. Do they get more food there? I'm sorry? Do they get more food there? Yeah, they can, they can return um, more than just once every six months. They, like and it's also, and this is, this is